Hello, this is Jim Leggio from AIAG, Program Manager in Supply Chain Products and Services. Today we bring you a webinar on the USMCA overview as presented by US Customs and Border Protection, Director Tamika Solomon, and Project Lead Adam Talitsky. As I mentioned, today's presenters are Director of the USMCA Center, Tamika C. Solomon, and CBP USMCA Project Lead, Adam Saluski. I will be your moderator today. We'll have time at the end for a few questions, which we'll go over on this webinar. As the Acting Director for the USMCA Center in Trade Policy and Programs at USCBP, Tamika Solomon has over 15 years of progressive public service experience which includes both federal and state level experience. Tamika joined CBP in May of 2017 as an assistant field director for regulatory audit and agency advisory services in Houston, Texas. Prior to joining CBP, Tamika worked for the Department of Defense National Guard in New Mexico, where she successfully led our nation's heroes and helped to save government funds. Tamika has a bachelor's degree in accounting and graduate studies in public administration from Southern University Agriculture and Mechanical College in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and a master's degree in government accounting from Rutgers State University Business School in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Tamika is a certified government audit professional, CGAP, and a certified internal controls auditor, CICA. Tamika's expertise in audit and risk management helps advance Office of Trade's mission to facilitate legitimate trade enforce U.S. laws, and protect the American economy to ensure consumer safety and to create a level play playing field for American business. Tamika's co-presenter today is Adam M. Saluski, Project Lead. Adam serves as the Project Lead for U.S. CBP's U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement Center, or USMCA Center, with the mission to coordinate CBP's implementation of the USMCA to ensure a smooth transition with consistent and comprehensive guidance to internal and external stakeholders. Mr. Saluski began service with USCBP in 2010 and has served in several trade-focused roles, including trade agreements and special trade legislation, anti-dumping and countervailing duties, international affairs, congressional affairs, training and trade stakeholder engagement. He is a Presidential Management Fellowship alumni and has been recognized with the CBP's Commissioner Award and the World Customs Organization Certificate of Merit. Mr. Saluski earned his JD from Suffolk University Law School and is licensed to practice law in New York and Massachusetts. A bit about AIAG today, our hosts for the webinar. If you're unfamiliar with AIAG, we are an industry automotive trade association founded in 1982 by several large automakers. AIAG's unique member forum allows us to collaborate on emergency industry issues because our membership is comprised of OEMs, automotive suppliers of all sizes, service providers, government, and academia. Our strength at AIAG is its membership. At 3,600 member companies and growing, we recruit and uh, you utilize 750 plus industry volunteers from over 200 companies providing expertise in their subject matter areas. At any given moment, there are roughly 60 active projects and committees taking place at AIAG, including a USMCA working group that has worked closely to understand the new regulations. At any given moment, AIAG has between 48 and 50 employees, including subject matter experts on staff in supply chain management, quality, and corporate responsibility. What we do at AIAG is support the global automotive and related industries commitment to providing seamless, efficient, and responsible supply chain activities by providing a neutral, open, professional, and legally collaborative infrastructure to gather stakeholders' input and solicit engagement. AIAG acts as an industry sentinel, assuring our members' awareness, understanding, and knowledge and responsiveness to emerging risks. AIAG is a global resource for mission-critical supply chain management content developed by the industry for the industry. We also serve as a platform for robust knowledge transfer processes to attract, onboard, and retain the next generation of industry professionals.
And with that short introduction, I would like to hand over the presentation to the USMCA Center, Adam Saluski and Tamika Solomon. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's briefing on the new United States Mexico Canada Agreement, or USMCA. Um, today, we're going to be talking about all things USMCA. Um, next slide, please. So here's a preview of the topics that we will cover in today's briefing. We will first um, provide a quick overview of the USMCA and highlight a few items for your consideration. Next, we're going to introduce the USMCA Center, a one-stop shop for all things USMCA. Next, we're going to cover entry procedures so that you can learn how to make a claim under USMCA. Finally, we're going to detail the multitude of USMCA-related resources that are available to you to support your preparations for USMCA entry into force on July 1st of 2020. Next slide, please. So um, again, thank you for joining us today. Um, the objective of this webinar is to present an overview of our efforts to implement the USMCA. We will answer a few questions and we're going to share resources to help you prepare for entry into force. Next slide, please. With that, we'll begin our discussion on the USMCA. The USMCA will modernize trade and revitalize the US manufacturing and agriculture um, industries. There are new and novel provisions for automotive rules of origin, but there are also things that stay the same. Some highlights are regional value content increase from 62.5% to 75% under the USMCA. That means that 75% of a car's value uh, must be produced in North America. In addition to the certification of origin, producers of passenger vehicles, light trucks, and heavy trucks are required to submit three new certifications to receive preferential tariff treatment. Um, that those are labor value content, steel certification, and aluminum certification. For 2020, these um, three certifications are due by December 31st, 2020. Um, a little bit more about the labor value content is that it was introduced in the USMCA and under this provision, new automotive goods will only receive preferential tariff treatment if the importer certifies that a certain percentage of the automobile's content by value is sourced from manufacturing facilities paying at least $16 per hour. CBP is collaborating with our US government partners, as well as Canadian and Mexico um, customs counterparts. And we're also partnering with the trade community to ensure a comprehensive and smooth implementation of the USMCA. Next slide, please. The following slide details specific provisions of the new USMCA agreement. Um, things that you want to be aware of is the USMCA includes a 16 year sunset clause and all three parties are required to reevaluate the agreement every six years. Um, the certification of origin is required at the time the USMCA preference claim is made. Um, there is no prescribed format for the certification of origin form. It may cover a single importation or multiple importations. And we have more information on that in our implementing instructions. And you're going to, we provided an updated copy on June 16th, but just for, so that you're aware, we're also going to have a new uh, final version coming out uh, today on the implementing instructions, and you'll find more information on the nine elements within that document. Um, there are no separate marking rules for USMCA versus NAFTA. 
we are going to continue to use NAFTA marking rules for the immediate future. Uh, more guidance will be forthcoming on that issue um, in the USC 182 once it's finalized. Um, originating goods and tariff preference level are TPL goods are exempt from merchandise processing fees if the claim is if the claim is made at the time of entry um the mpf paid at the time of entry will not be refunded for post implementation claims for preference um again we have posted um some new implementing instructions um once the new final version is out to uh today a csms message will go out so be on the lookout for that um some of the things that you want to be aware of in that updated version is the references um made their new references made throughout the document to the uniform regulations um 19 cfr 182 and also to hts us general note 11. um we have added some language in those instructions indicating the flexibility in in enforcement for the six months following USMCA's entry into force. And um, yes, um, that is what we're planning to do, but let me explain a little bit about what that means. So um, the relaxed enforcement and restraining enforcement doesn't necessarily mean that we will not exercise enforcement for the six, the first six months. What that means is that um, we understand that the trade may need time to adjust business practices to comply with the new requirements under the USMCA, um, particularly related to the preferential tariff treatment of goods. Um, importers are still gonna be required to exercise reasonable care when making a claim under the USMCA, um, including ensuring they are in possession of a complete and valid certificate, certification of origin at the time of making a claim, and also meeting all the record keeping obligations. So know your product, know your customer. Um, in order to help again with that process, we're gonna, um, provide inappropriate circumstances, restraint and enforcement during this time period after entry into force. So um, as long as importers are making satisfactory progress towards compliance and making a good faith effort to comply with the rules of um, the USMCA, we're gonna relax enforcement um in those regards so another thing we've added in the new implementing instructions are rules um, and procedures on the auto rules of origin requirements um, just again to remind everyone that um, there is no standard certification form and as of july 1st the nafta certificate of origin form will not be accepted by cbp so uh, specific um, things that we've added related to the auto rules of origin is we added information on the LVC and steel and aluminum certifications. We've added two annexes for data elements for a motor vehicle, LVC and RVC averaging elections, which replaces NAFTA form 447. And we also included um, the required data elements for those aluminum and steel certifications. So next slide, please. So with that, we'll now talk about the USMCA Center, which is a cornerstone piece of CBP's Office of Trade Strategy for the successful implementation of the USMCA. So here you'll see on this slide, um, the points of contact for the USMCA. You have myself, Tamika Solomon, the acting director for the USMCA Center. You also have um, Adam Skaletsky. He's the USMCA Center's lead. 
And you also have our partners in the textile and trade agreements directorate. So you have the director, Maya Kumar, and you also have her three branch chiefs listed. So her branch chief for the trade agreements is uh, Margaret Gray. You have the branch chief for the textiles and policy area, uh, Ms. Anita Harris, and you have the branch chief for enforcement, Ms. Jacqueline Sprugel. In total, we make up your point of contacts for the USMCA. Next slide, please. So um, Customs and Border Protection, as most people know, is the lead implementing agency with respects to the USMCA. Um, to this end, CBP has launched the USMCA Center, which um, our purpose is to ensure, coordinate, and guide the implementation of the USMCA for CBP and our stakeholders. Um, the USMCA Center is your one-stop shop for all things USMCA. The USMCA Center will coordinate CBP's implementation and enforcement of the USMCA to ensure a smooth transition with consistent and comprehensive guidance to our internal and stake, external stakeholders. Organizationally, we are housed within um, CBP's Office of Trade and our center includes experts from across the various CBP headquarter offices, as well as centers of excellence and expertise. Um, and our staff makes up, um, is made up of auditors, attorneys, we have national entry specialists, and we have import specialists, just to name a few of the experts that we have. So as you can see, we're definitely ready to implement uh, this agreement. Um, we've launched the center back in March of 2020, and this center will operate for three to five years. Again, we're going to, um, the purpose of this center is for you to have a one stop shop place, and we handle all the coordination, tracking, and promoting of the implementation and enforcement efforts. Um, we're expecting our mission to evolve as we move. Um, further away from the entry into force. We have those three guiding responsibilities, however, that will guide our work as we involve, and that's coordination, communication, regulations, and policy. CBP will continue to communicate with the trade stakeholders throughout the implementation process as we transition from NAFTA to USMCA. Um, just wanna say, that remember we are your center so whatever you need please check with us uh, we have a ton of resources available and our center is here to help you um, navigate the transition from nafta to the usmca next slide please with that um, i'm gonna turn over the presentation to adam skaletsky He's gonna um, talk to you about the entry procedures and the requirements of the USMCA. Adam? Good afternoon. We're going to be talking about um, several of the requirements within the USMCA for mm -hmm. importers seeking to claim preferential treatment. One thing unique for the USMCA is that this is a transition from an existing trade agreement as opposed to a brand new trade agreement with a new country. So a lot of the preference of treatment um, that was often under NAFTA will continue, but there are some specific changes and we're going to review them within these slides. Please note that all of this information is contained within CBP's implementation instruction, instructions, which were most recently published on June the 16th and as of today, June 30th, will be updated very short in very short order. Again, we'll be talking about making a claim, merchandise processing fees, reconciliation, drawback, country of origin, post-importation claim, de minimis, treatment of sets, transit and transshipment. Next slide. First, in terms of making a claim, in general, tariff items eligible for preferential treatment under the USMCA 
we'll use the new special program indicator S, S as in Sierra, that will be reflected in the special column of the harmonized tariff schedule. When filing a claim, the filer will certify that the goods comply with all rules of origin and record keeping requirements, including those the new and novel provisions related to automotive goods. Some additional considerations. The USMCA may also be claimed on unconditionally free tariff items, provided they meet all requisite USMCA requirements in order to receive an exemption from merchandise processing fees. In these cases, the SPIS, S is in Sierra, will not be listed in the special column of the HTS but will still be required when filing a claim to receive MPF. An S plus, S is in Sierra plus SPI will also be available, primarily for some agricultural goods, and that will be clarified in the pending General Note 11 to be published by the U.S. International Trade Commission. Next slide. For most entry types, these refer to the date of entry or withdrawal from consumption in order to determine whether you will seek preferential treatment under NAFTA or the USMCA. If the good is entered on or prior to June 30th, NAFTA applies. And NAFTA rules will continue to apply for that import throughout its life up to liquidation. On July 1st or afterwards, apply for preferential treatment using the USMCA. There is no transitional period between NAFTA and the USMCA. There is no overlap. Starting on July 1st and afterwards, only the USMCA is available if you're seeking preferential treatment for country of origin goods, Canada, Mexico, or the United States. The following entry types do have special handling requirements in the USMCA, which will be explored in subsequent slides. Reconciliation, type entry type 09, and drawback, entry type 47. Please note, entry type 08, NAFTA duty deferral, will continue to exist as entry type 08, USMCA duty deferral. Next slide. Merchandise processing fees. Claims for MPF exemptions on originating and tariff preference level goods must be made at the time of entry. And all ACE programming updates needed to process MPF exemptions and 19 USC 1520D restrictions will be live on entry into force July 1st. Please note, currently the USMCA does not permit MPF refunds on post-importation claims. This, the NAFTA had allowed um, MPF refunds on post-importation claims, but the USMCA Implementation Act does not contain the same provisions. We understand that this is an inadvertent legislative drafting error. And we have consulted with the US Congress and alerted them to this challenge, and they are currently working to address it. Uh, we do not have a specific calendar on when or how this will be addressed or if any kind of re legislative remedy will apply retroactively. But as it stands today, the USMCA does not permit MPF refunds on post-importation claims. This applies both to individual and reconciliation filings. Next slide. Reconciliation. Reconciliation entry type 09 processing. Starting July 1st, importers can flag an entry summary at the time it is filed for the possibility of making a post-importation claim for the USMCA. Reconciliation entries are not mandatory, but it is the exclusive means to file a USMCA claim once the entry summary is flagged. After flagging the entry summary, the filing of a separate USMCA claim covering the entry summary will be considered duplicative and will not be accepted. The lower two scenarios where both a NAFTA and a USMCA claim are applicable after USMCA entry into force. In the first on the left, an entry summary dated on June 20th was, could be flagged as a possible NAFTA claim on June 30th, 2020. And then this next summer on June 19th, 2021, the importer can file a reconciliation entry type 09 claiming NAFTA because the original entry date was prior to July 1st. In the second scenario, with an entry summary dated on July 2nd, 2020, 
and flagged as a possible USMCA claim on July 12th, 2020. This next summer, July 11th, 2021, an importer can file a reconciliation entry type 09 claiming USMCA because the original entry date was post entry into force. For further questions regarding reconciliation processing, please forward these to our recon um, colleagues at ot-recon folder at cbp.dhs.gov. Next slide, please. Drawback. In general, the USMCA retains the drawback restrictions that exist under NAFTA. However, the USMCA does feature five key changes or considerations listed below. Substitution standards, the sugar exception, conditions of export, the ACE indicator for drawback, drawback claims for Section 201 and 301 duties. Next slide. Now, to talk about these briefly, I realize this is an automotive focus group, but it's important to note these specific changes. For substitution standards, the USMCA adopts the Trade Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act, CAPTIA, substitution standards when drawback is permitted. That is, substitution under the same eight-digit HTS subheading rather than NAFTA's, quote, same kind and quality, quote, substitution. Sugar exception. The USMCA expands the scope of the sugar exception, which retains substantial transformation substitution standards, that is, pre tiptia substitution standards of same kind and quality of specific sugar products. Conditions of export. The USMCA removes a NAFTA provision that applied a fee pursuant to Section 22 of the U.S. Agricultural Adjustment Act. Next slide. ACE indicator for drawback. For entries that are relevant for drawback under the USMCA, CBP has created an ACE indicator or checkbox that is added at the claim level to handle drawback. And CBP expects that sunset for drawback entries will be at least five years after the USMCA enters into force. Drawback claims for Section 201 and 301. As with NAFTA, drawback filers for the USMCA can submit claims related to Section 201 and 301 duties. And please note the Cargo Systems Messaging Service message 19-000050 for more information. Next slide. For more instances on drawback, does NAFTA or the USMCA apply? Again, the date of entry is the critical question. So on June 30th, today, only NAFTA drawback claims can be filed with designated imports dated on or before June 30th. On July 1st, NAFTA drawback claims can continue to be filed until 2025, so long as the designated import entry date is June 30th or earlier. USMCA drawback claims can begin to be filed on designated imports that were entered on July 1st. So, and then subsequently July 1st, 2nd, and all days afterwards after the USMCA entry into force, NAFTA drawback claims can continue to be filed until 2025 with designated imports, provided they are entered originally on or before June 30th. And USMCA drawback claims can be filed on designated imports on ongoing so long as the entry date is on or after July 1st, 2020. Please note that an import dated July, June 30th, 2020 and an import dated July 1st, 2020 will not be allowed on the same drawback claim. And drawback claimants need to file two separate claims for NAFTA and the USMCA with their respective consumption entry date. Next slide. Country of origin marking. So in general, the rules of origin contained in 19 CFR determine the country of origin for marking purposes of a good imported from Canada or Mexico in accordance with the requirements of 19 CFR part 134. For most goods, only product specific rules of origin contained in general note 11, again, the pending general note 11, which will be published in short order, are needed to determine whether the goods are originating. Specific changes from NAFTA. Unlike NAFTA, a good does not need to qualify as marked as a good of Canada or Mexico in order to receive preferential tariff treatment under the USMCA, with the exception of certain agricultural goods. And in addition, a good of non-foreign origin, that is a good made in the United States, 
is also eligible for preferential tariff treatment, and the United States will be accepted as a country of origin on a USMCA claim. Next slide. Post-importation claims. The USMCA allows importers to file post-importation claims to request refunds on excess duties paid on qualifying goods pursuant to 19 U.S.C. 1520D. Post-summary corrections are not allowed on USMCA claims. In general, there is no change in requirements between NAFTA and the USMCA as it pertains to the effective period, the responsible party, and eligibility. A post-importation claim submitted individually or through the ACE reconciliation prototype must include the following information. A declaration that the good qualifies, the certification of origin, note not a certificate, but a certification, a statement on whether the doc provided was provided to any other person, and a statement on whether the protest or petition was filed. Next slide. Post-importation claim determination. A post-importation claim will be denied with a statement specifying deficiencies, if any of the following apply. Certification of origin is illegible, incomplete, or contains incorrect information, or the claim otherwise does not comply with requirements. Post-importation claim corrections. Corrections are allowed on post-importation claims unless the claim has already been reviewed and decided upon up to the one-year expiration period of the post-importation claim. Next slide. De minimis. The de minimis provisions allow the good to qualify as originating if it contains no more than 10% of non-originating materials, including those subject to regional value content requirements. The value of all non-originating materials used in the production of the good cannot exceed 10% of either the transaction value or the total cost of the good. Regional value content requirements, if also subject to RVC requirements, the value of de minimis materials is included in the total value of non-originating materials. Goods that qualify for de minimis are not required to satisfy RVC requirements, provided that the good satisfies all other applicable requirements. Next slide. Treatment of set. Except as provided for in the product-specific rules of origin in General Note 11, goods including textiles and wearing apparel put up in sets for retail sale and classified as a result of the application of General Rule of Interpretation 3 are originating if each good in the set is originating and both the set and the individual goods meet all other applicable requirements. Or, 10% of non-originating goods does not exceed 10% of the value of the set, and the good meets all other applicable requirements. Next slide. Transit and transshipment. An originating good retains its status if it has been transported to the United States without passing through the territory of a non-party. In addition, if an originating good is transported outside the territories of the parties, under the USMCA, the good will retain its originating status if the good remains under customs control in the territory of a non-party and the good does not undergo an operation outside the territories of the parties, other than unloading, reloading, separation, storing, labeling, and marking or any other operations necessary to preserve it in good condition or to transport the good to the territory of the importing party. Next slide. We're now going to talk about informational resources CBP has created for the assistance of the trade as they prepare for compliance with the new USMCA. Next slide. So as Director Solomon had briefed earlier in this presentation, the USMCA Center has been stood up this past March 2020 and is seeking to connect the trade on information, resources, and tools as we proceed to implement the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement. Our primary resource that I want all of you to bookmark is our USMCA webpage. All of our resources, both CBP's resources and links to external resources, are available on this page. It will continually be kept updated. This is an important website to bookmark. The address is here on the slide. It is a bit long, so you can also search USMCA at cbp.gov search field on our main webpage, and this is the first page that comes up. Um, 
CBP has done a great deal of informational briefing already. We're performing this briefing and with numerous other trade associations, industry groups, and other trade stakeholders. And we are continually scheduling additional ones. Um, we have our numerous amount of written materials, um, compliance guidance, fact sheets, side-by-side -side comparisons between NAFTA and the USMCA, points of contact, FAQs, which we'll talk all in detail in a moment. And then finally, links to external parties, um, other USG parties that have relevant resources for compliance with the USMCA. Again, please do bookmark this webpage, or you can search USMCA at cvp.gov. Next slide. We're also doing um, additional webinars. We've pre-recorded some webinars on USMCA compliance. These are available currently at cvp.gov. Go to our webinar page and this is the first one that comes up. These cover entry procedures, certifications and verifications, rules of origin, textiles, and a particular interest to this group, auto and auto parts. So check that out at cvp.gov USMCA webpage. We have a link to our webinar list. Next slide. Some foundational documents it's important to note. One, the agreement text, the Implementation Act, which was passed into law earlier this January 2020. We have our uniform regulations, which are being published um, in the next few days as an interim final rule via the Federal Register. And we also then also have our domestic regulations, which will be following up soon to create the new 19 CFR Part 182 to accompany NAFTA as Part 181. These regs will be reviewed and made permanent after one year. And then also to note the Harmonized Tariff Schedules General Note 11 to be issued by the U.S. International Trade Commission um, really any moment now as it is June 30th, but in short order. All of these products now and as they become available will be linked to our USMCA webpage at cvp.gov. Next slide. Interim and final implementing instructions. Um, if you take nothing else from this presentation, I urge you to please visit our webpage and download the USMCA interim implementing instructions. This serves as a user manual for the USMCA for importers seeking to claim preferential treatment and to understand how to comply with its requirements. Most recently published on June the 16th, and has, as Director Solomon had said, will be updated in short order to accommodate the general note and other last minute requirements. Um, as this is an automotive group, group, I did want to also specifically point out that we have our colleagues at the U.S. Department of Labor, Wage and Hour Division, have contributed a lot of information regarding compliance with labor value content as it pertains to their um, assessment of manufacturing facility wage practices. Um, and notes again, the pending general note will be accommodated within this document and we will be republishing it um, by July the 1st. Again, please do download these. They are free for your use and we're eager to ensure that you have these in preparation for your compliance requirements. Next slide. Now, I realize that all of you in the industry work very hard. You have more things to do than sit at your computer and click refresh on cbp.gov all day long. So CBP has been working hard to maximize exposure to the trade on all of these resources as we develop them and roll them out. So this is getting this in front of as many eyeballs as possible with these trade briefings that I've referenced but also other media engagement, briefings to the press, press releases issued, um, coverage of our rollout, coverage of the information we have for compliance guidance. So do watch that via all the different trade media publications. We are also rolling out some brief informational videos of about approximately two minutes in length, ideal for posting in social media accounts, for embedding in websites. And these videos will highlight the um, transition from NAFTA to the USMCA, and specific requirements that the trade should look into for compliance. Next slide. In addition, we have multiple fact sheets being developed by CBP Office of Trade on various aspects of the USMCA, including some of the entry changes that I detailed previously, but other ones relating to other aspects of the agreement, including side-by-sides -side between NASA and the USMCA, to um, facilitate comparisons so that people can prepare as they work to accommodate the USMCA into their compliance processes. 
All of that will be available at cbp.gov. <clears throat> we also have a long list of frequently asked questions. We've been receiving a great deal of interest from the trade on various aspects of the USMCA, and we are working to ensure that the questions we answer are incorporated into a list of FAQs on our webpage. So definitely a, a very useful resource for you as we continually um, get greater clarity on how the USMCA will be implemented in all the different um, enforcement scenarios we are encountering. This information is also continuously updated. So if you continue to ask us questions, you might just see that question included on our webpage. We hope it will continue to be a useful resource. Next slide. Now a lot has changed with the USMCA. We've been talking about changes to rules of origin, changes to all these specific aspects of entry, but a lot has stayed the same. We still have our centers of excellence and expertise, including our um, very helpful automotive and aeronautics center in Detroit. We still have um, Trusted Trader. We still have Single Window. In fact, NAFTA, USMCA really fortifies a lot of that. But another thing I want to emphasize is that we still have our binding advance rulings. If you seek additional um, reassurance, additional certainty that your commodity, that your import process, that your supply chain will continue to receive um, preferential treatment under the USMCA as we transition from NAFTA, CBP's Office of Regs and Rulings is able to uh, uh, issue binding advance rulings with 30 days notice um, on preferential treatment issues. So please do reach out to them, www.cbp.gov slash trade slash rulings if you seek a binding advance ruling. Also, we are utilizing the cargo system messaging service. CMS, CSMS will be used to roll out all of the different resources that I've talked about. Um, both pending new ones and if there's any other significant rollouts within USMCA, an important thing to subscribe to if you are interested, CSMS. And then to roll this out, we also have our CBP trade snapshot articles published monthly featuring different aspects of um, CBP's trade enforcement and facilitation mission, and we'll be including updates on the USMCA in this publication. Also, we're working to ensure that all of CBP speaks with one voice, so we've been ensuring all of this information is forwarded to the CBP Information Center, both with our Ask CBP search engine and our CBP call center. And finally, um, we've been working to promote all of these products, all of these rollouts on our different social media platforms. So if you follow, if you are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or if you use YouTube, please do give us a follow and you will be, we will be highlighting USMCA resources on these platforms. Next slide. Some external resources I do want to highlight, the Harmonized Tariff, the harmonized tariff Schedule of the United States, uh, hosted by the U.S. International Trade Commission. That is where the general note will be plugged in to get USMCA into the HTS. The U.S. Trade Representative has a large amount of information on the USMCA as well. Um, USMCA touches on numerous uh, topics that are not necessarily CBP's lead, for example, digital trade, telecommunications. Um, but the U.S. Trade Representative has a great deal of information on that if you are interested, just wanted to give them a shout out. There's also many um, either very new or pending Federal Register notices related to the USMCA. A particular note to the automotive industry, USTR published a Federal Register notice on alternative staging for automotive goods, which was published on April 21st. The U.S. Department of Labor is issuing a Federal Register notice pertaining to the new labor value content. That is um, in final preparation and it will be published on July the 1st, 2020. Likewise, CBP's interim final rule on the uniform regs is going to be published by July 1st. And we are also awaiting the domestic regs IFR, which will be coming in the pending in the coming days. So a lot more to be coming via the FRN. If you have questions related to how Canada and Mexico will be implementing the USMCA, um, if you have questions on how your exports will be treated or how you can gain greater understanding of how to comply with those requirements, uh, we have our partners at the US Department of Commerce, International Trade Administration. Please do give them um, a reach out. And then finally, if all of these resources do not answer your inquiries, either the implementing instructions, our webpage, our frequently asked questions, all of the written and audiovisual material we have, or any of these um, direct links to the external resources. We also have our general inbox, usmca at cbp.dhs.gov. You can email us and we will seek to the best of our ability to answer your inquiry. 
would encourage you though, please do review all of these resources first before um, reaching out to us just so that we can ensure that you get a timely answer and they already be there in our existing materials. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, Adam and Tamika, Director Solomon, that has been very, very helpful. The industry, as you've mentioned, is very keen to understand the new regulations and they've been very engaged. And we, we kindly thank CBP for being uh, transparent and working with the trade and providing a lot of answers to these, these questions and these um, details as we move towards implementation day tomorrow. So um, if you don't mind, we have a couple of questions that have come in in preparation for this webinar, and I'd like to go ahead and propose those now. Uh, first question, will CBP publish more information on the informed compliance program for USMCA and how will it work for importers? So I want to, this is Adam Selesky, would like to point you first and foremost to the implementing instructions, which will be updated on June, very shortly on June 30th, 2020. Um, that has a great deal of information as to the initial rollout and the relaxed enforcement period. We also um, are now going to be working to produce additional materials in the coming months um, as we get past entry into force to further augment our guidance. So additional materials are pending as well, but please do use the implementing instructions as your go-to to prepare for entry into force. Okay, thanks Adam. Uh, second question, is the informed compliance period six or 12 months for automotive companies? And is there a difference between the first six months and second six month period? Right now in the implementing instructions, um, we have that it's um, a waiting period for the first six months, but we are in discussions to have an extended period for automotive companies. But however, that has not been formally um, approved or documented, it's just in discussion stages at this point in time. So right now, there would be no real distinction in the discussions between the first six months versus the second six months. Okay, thank you, Director Solomon. Uh, third question, is it correct that Congress may revise the USMCA implementing legislation to allow for MPF refunds on post-entry USMCA claims? Uh, Adam, I believe you touched on this, if you could reiterate, uh, and the question says, if yeah. yes, will the refunds be retroactive at all to July 1st, 2020? Yes, this is Adam Selesky. We have alerted the U.S. Congress um, to the MPF issue, the fact that one cannot receive an MPF refund on a post-importation claim of preferential treatment, and we have to defer to the U.S. Congress as to when and how they will address it. We believe it will require a legislative fix. Um, and then also, likewise, if it will be retroactive, uh, defer to the U.S. Congress on that at the immediate time. Okay, thank you, Adam. Next question, can suppliers benefit from vehicle producer or OEM alternative staging regimes? Hi, this is Adam Selesky. The alternative staging regime, which many of you may be familiar with, is a process by which um, importers may seek additional time for compliance up to five years after entry into force. Those um, are required. You have to specifically seek those from the U.S. Trade Representative. Um, the deadline is actually July 1st via their um, FRN, which I noted in the presentation. Uh, F, that is a U.S. Trade Representative-led process and we defer to them as to who and what will qualify for alternative staging plans. Okay, thanks. Um, next question, do tier two suppliers need to respond to LVC requests from vehicle producers if they do not directly supply to vehicle assembly plants, but rather supply to tier one suppliers? So level two suppliers applying to tier one suppliers are they required to respond to LVC requests from OEMs or vehicle producers if they do not directly supply to the assembly plant? Yeah. 
One moment, we're checking. Hi, this is Adam Celeste with the USMCA Center. We're going to take that question back. Um, a lot of this has to do with, you know, auto, man auto manufacturers are going to be contractually requiring perhaps additional information so that they are prepared for their own compliance guidance. Um, and they may require, you know, in order to contract or to provide materials, they have to provide information on X, Y, and Z that was not required previously. But um, we'll take that question back and give a more uh, definitive answer for this group. Great, thank you. Next question, as of July 1, 2020, can I claim USMCA on imports of USMCA qualifying US origin goods imported from Canada or Mexico? Hi, this is Adam Stileski. Yes, the USMCA allows you to claim country of origin, United States. That was not previously allowed under NAFTA. Thank you, Adam. The rule of origin from my company's products, I'm sorry, for my company's products does not change from NAFTA to USMCA. Do I need to do anything different for USMCA? If yes, what do I need to do? Hi, this is Adam Selesky. Please note that you are no longer allowed to use the NAFTA 434 Certificate of Origin for USMCA. That will no longer be accepted. The certification of origin in that when one uses the SPI to claim preferential treatment requires that the importer of record have in their records all of the required data elements, which are specified in USMCA Chapter 5 uh, Annex 5A, the nine data elements. So there's no longer a specific piece of paper, no longer a specific form required, but you are required to have all that information um, in your records if you, there is a subsequent verification of that certification. So there is a switch from a certificate of origin to a certification of origin. You're still claiming the preferential treatment and you're asserting your compliance when using that SPI, but there's no specific form that you have to use. That is a major change. And it's actually modernizing the USMCA to be more like other trade agreements that were signed in more, more recently. For example, CAFTA, um, Jordan, Bahrain, Peru, Chile, those also don't require specific forms. So it modernizes NAFTA in that sense. That's a major change. Um, and that's a good starting point. And we urge you also, please do read the implementing instructions. While NAFTA and USMCA are very similar, just as we've detailed in that entry presentation, there are slight changes here and there. And so it's a bit trickier than just a new trade agreement where it's all brand new. We don't want people to rely on old habits. We want everyone to ensure they're doing their reasonable care. So please do read the implementing instructions and check. Thank you for that cl uh, clarification, Adam. I think that's very helpful for the industry to hear again. I'm much appreciated. Um, if, if the rules allow, can we qualify a heavy duty truck part under the tariff shift method or are we restricted to RVC only? I, I'm. I, we will be taking that one back. Um, if you could make sure we get those in writing, I want to ensure to give a precise answer. I'm not immediately sure. Sure, not a problem at all. We'll provide these. Uh, and final question. It's a bit complicated. I'll try to slim it down for you, Adam. Um, how do we handle goods that have been processed outside of the U.S. and returned? For example, a vehicle handle that is manufactured in the United States is eligible for USMCA 
goes out to Canada to be painted and then is returned to the U.S. So in this situation, a, a processor has previously stated they cannot complete a certi certification because they are only a processor and not a producer. So in other words, the, the subcontracted painting company in Canada. Mm -hmm. Under NAFTA, we had them complete a processor certificate and claimed NAFTA on the article because we are the manufacturer and based on our bill of material. One moment. One moment. That's fine, Adam. We can edit these these yep. um, silences yeah. out later. Yep. Okay. I'm getting an answer. We're gonna to have to take that one back. I, it, it goes down to if it if it advances the parts value. Painting may advance its value, and so it may change it. I'm gonna to need to probably to take that one back. Apologies. And there may be another chapter 98 provision for that. I'm gonna we're gonna to have to check. Okay, not a problem at all. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, this is Jim Leggio at AIAG. I want to thank everybody for their participation today and thank thank you very kindly to Director Solomon and Mr. Adam Selesky for presenting uh, this comprehensive overview of the USMCA. Um, AIAG is, is very uh, much in line with understanding these new regulations via our working group and is working hard to update the USMCA content reporting training, which will be a two-day uh, in-depth practitioner level course that will be available in a virtual environment very soon. We're working uh, as, as hard as we can to get that on, online. Uh, eventually, it will be a classroom-style setting as soon as the pandemic uh, is, is over. I want to remind also the audience that on November 4th, we have the Customs Town Hall event, which is an annual event. This year, it will be a virtual event. Uh, registration is open on AIAG.org, which is our website. You can find that under the events page. Very low cost of admission for a virtual event this year. Um, typically, we have fantastic speakers, including CBP. So with that, I want to thank Director Solomon again and Mr. Selesky. And I want to say we're also, I believe, on the schedule for that, aren't we, for AIG for November? I believe we are. Yes, CBP is, yes, your CBP yeah. is a, a regular on the agenda. And we, again, we thank awesome. you for your support of that event. Yep. And I do also want to say so, um, for this automotive group specifically, we also just want to give um, kudos to our Office of Trade Relations for their work to arrange this. Also, please do note that we have created a Commercial Operations Advisory Committee working group specifically on auto rules of origin. Um, as has been stressed, these are new and novel. So it will be a learning experience for all of us as we enter this entry into force phase on how can we best work this, how can we ensure um, facilitated compliance, how can we ensure that you have maximum clarity as you all prepare for your implementation? 
So we're very eager to receive feedback via COAC as well. You can get more information on that via our Office of Trade Relations. Thanks very much, Adam, and thank you, uh, D Director Solomon, Tamika, as well. Um, as Adam mentioned, yes, the cooperation has been fantastic between CBP and AIAG, and we do encourage you to reach out. Um, all contacts have been provided, so we look forward to working with you in, in uh, a successful journey upon implementation. For us all, my friend, for us all, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.